Hello, everyone. Welcome to Angular Insights. Gil and I are thrilled to be joined by Ash Fontana, the Managing Director at Zeta Venture Partners and author of the new book, The, Fir the AI First Company. We'll be discussing how to define competitive advantage in the AI first century. Quick note on how this fireside chat will run. Uh, Gil will give a quick overview and background on Ash. Then we will have an interactive Q&A discussion um, if you'd like to participate, please click raise hand to ask Ash a question over audio or type a question into the Q&A section. Thank you so much. And Gil, go ahead, take it away. Hey, Ash, thanks. Thanks, thanks so much for doing this. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and uh, uh, just, you know, a bit about you, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because I, whenever I would introduce a founder to you or list you as one of the people that I could introduce, I would say this is a guy who basically wrote the book on investing in AI companies, but that was the article. <laughs> and now you've actually gone and written the actual book on AI. Um, so I'll, I don't uh, know if that means I have to update my the way I introduce you or not, but but um, I, very I, prescient I, of you. <laughs> uh, exactly, my algorithms are very well tuned. Um, yeah. So uh, you know we've you know been uh, you know, associates for for a while. We actually do have a co-investment together in Crate, which was a, a deal that I did when I was at DFJ Spree. Um, you have an amazing track record as a VC and as an angel and an advisor. I'll just mention a few things. Um, Kaggle, uh, which was founded in 2010, raised 60 million dollars, acquired by Google, was a really really interesting company, and it might be interesting for you to just tell us a little bit about that and that thesis. But that was, if I remember right, that was the community like the place where you could run a competition to solve an AI problem back when people were just starting to realize that hey maybe maybe this is something that needs to be productized in some form and mm -hmm. the only way to do it then was with people so mm -hmm. you sort of made it easy for people to find for, for mm -hmm. customers to find who could solve these AI uh, 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 challenges for us uh, Tractable which is a UK based company backed by Insight raised I think over like 150 million dollars at this point something like that yeah raised, they've actually raised um, not that much considering where they're at. They've raised yeah. basically less than what they're earning and worth over a billion. Yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing story. And one that I, you know, embarrassed to say I passed on at the seed stage because I completely didn't get it. Um, Lilt backed by uh, Zeta at the seed stage and then by Sequoia and Intel, a super interesting company in the localization space. You're an advisor to Numerai, which is a fascinating uh crypto data science driven hedge fund thing that, you know, mm -hmm. maybe if we have extra time, you can explain to us what that is. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you're also an angel investor in Canva um, and a whole bunch of other cool things. And most recently you wrote a book, uh, the AI first company, which is kind of why we're here. Um, it's called the AI first company, how to compete and win with artificial intelligence. Um, because, you know, I want to help get this book out. Uh, can we just briefly just tell people where they can find that book and why they should find that book? And then we'll yeah. So basically, you can find it anywhere. Uh, if you like audiobook, get it off on Amazon. If you like Kindle, get it there. If you want to walk into a bookstore, you should be able to find it in most bookstores um, or all the online bookstores, Barnes and Noble in the US and wherever. So you should be able to buy it anywhere. Why? Um, well, one really instrumental way to answer that question is if you want to get promoted. Basically, if you've got an idea for a way to make AI more prominent at a company you work at, then this is going to help you take that idea close to reality. Or if you're starting a company or running an existing company and want to just put the, put the trimmings on your AI strategy, you know, you might not have one today. You might have a bit of one. You might be completely focused on AI, but there are all these unique challenges about either bringing AI into a big company or starting a company with AI at its core around hiring and pricing and policy, all sorts of challenges. And that's what I try to get through. Cool, so you're, before we dive further into that, just a bit a bit more mm -hmm. about your, your own background and what, what you're doing now. Um, you, so the first thing to say is that you, you are Australian, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, you spent many years in the Valley. Now you mm -hmm. are sort of in Europe. Mm -hmm. you, won't, you, you won't say where in Europe, but you're in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I tried this pre-pandemic when I, I was not telling you where I was in Europe because I was moving. Mm -hmm. I haven't figured out how to move as frequently during the pandemic, but um, can you talk a little bit about why Europe and what you're seeing in Europe and how that relates to AI? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I've been coming back and forth to the UK and Europe for about eight years. So got AngelList spun up here and then started making investments here. The very first investment I made for Zeta was in London, um, Intractable. And I've made a few more since then. And so I've been going back and forth for a while. 
And it just got to the point over two years ago, actually, like quite a bit before the pandemic, where in any given week, the most promising companies that I really wanted to meet and research and spend time with were in the UK or Europe. As in, if I looked at my calendar, more than half of them were video calls with the UK or Europe. And so I thought, this is a bit funny, like I've got to just could just be there more permanently and actually just switch the balance a bit. And so we went to our investors, we were raising our third fund at the time and said, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to just switch the, the center of gravity a little bit more, um, you know, still have a team in SF, still have a team in New York, but really open up a front in London. Um, and, you know, that's my personal experience, really ignoring that for a second. The fact is that... As of two years ago, more machine learning research was published in Europe. There are more software developers in Europe, Europe and the UK and bundling them together than in the US. And the research institutions are much easier to access, I guess, from a, from a venture capital perspective in that there are less actual projects getting funded. So there are more projects, but less funding, and therefore there's a huge funding gap. And so I'm here to try to fill that. Um, I'm here to try to back the most important companies. Now, I'm not saying anything about the general tech market or the general economy. All I'm saying is for what I do, which is find machine learning research and try to bring it into the real world, it is objectively the case that there's more of it to back here than anywhere else in the world. Cool. Um, so it's not just forest fires and taxes and stuff like that that drove you out of the <laughs> That's um, very concerning too, but no, it's yeah. not just that. Um, I, I, you know, one of you know, probably your most well-known investment is mm -hmm. Canva um, that mm -hmm. most people would would know about. Um, and I, 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 you know, I know that in, in some level, okay, that was just an angel investment. It wasn't mm. the investment for Zeta, but but I, I did want to give you a chance to talk about it a little bit um, because Canva, at least when I first came across Canva, I wouldn't have said, oh, well, that's an AI company. Mm. And yet we've seen how companies like Wix, you know, Wix launched their AI site builder, which was actually like you, you know. I was skeptical, but it's actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about Canva's journey from your perspective towards bringing AI more and more into the product. I, I'd love to hear your, your take on that. So, so when you think mm -hmm. about from, from a founder's point of view, you start a company that's not necessarily AI per se, and then it becomes more and more. Can you talk about how Canva has done that? Yeah, I'm it? really glad you bring this up because it's actually time that I am refocusing on this whole space of using AI to help people create stuff to communicate better. Because, you know, a couple of things have happened here. A lot of computer vision technology has got better and better. And a lot of design tools have got more and more commoditized. And a lot of people have had to learn how to communicate in new ways because we're not in the office as much. We're not in front of each other as much. We're promoting more on social media and online channels. So all of these things have sort of come together and led to a huge opportunity, not just for Canva, but for a whole bunch of startups. You know, a startup I really wanted to back in Europe, UIZard, there are a whole bunch of companies out there, um, Runway ML, that are essentially helping people create things um, by automating more of what can be like quite a tedious process of designing something whether it's cutting out little bits of images, adjusting levels in photos, making things fit things, figuring out what colors go with what. These are all things computers can do very well now. So I'm glad you bring this up because I'm really focused on this problem of using AI to help people design better um, and go through that process of designing something um, a little bit more efficiently. Now, Canva has tracked that. You know, Canva had ideas about how to use AI from the very, very beginning, of course, but you know they had to go and do lots of other things. They had to go and collect an image library of millions of images. They had to see how people use the product, build all these templates and do lots and lots and lots of things. But today um, they're doing a lot. Um, so they do a lot of the things I mentioned. They use AI to make the process of cutting up images so they fit into your template better, fit into your presentation better. Um, you know, cutting out the edges of like a lion's mane. So when you just put it on your presentation, it fits. Um, figuring out which colors, figuring out what template you should use for what purpose. Given your constraints, you're going to post on Instagram. Is it like a happy or a sad thing? All that sort of stuff. And also video editing. I mean, that's a huge opportunity. Anyone who's sat in a video editor's studio knows it can be really tedious. I used to do this um, sort of for money, sort of for fun. 
and it's really, really tedious job. And Canva has got some really nice tools for that now as well. So they've got quite a significant team. Uh, I actually just gave a talk at Canva about AI in design, and there were hundreds of people at the talk uh, at the company. Um, so it's it's a really huge opportunity there. They're putting a lot of work into it, and it's already sort of in the background of the product every day. When you, you know, we're, we're, we're diving right into it, but that's, that's why we're mm. here. So when you yeah. describe Canva, it sounds like that's kind of hidden AI. The users mm. are not going, oh, wow, this is AI. Like they would mm -hmm. maybe, you know, our companies, do you see an evolution from, you know, AI being front and center? Like, look, we have AI when in some cases they didn't to we have AI mm -hmm. and you don't even know it's there, but it's making your life much better. I think that is the evolution, right? Um, it's just like software. We use a lot of software without realizing it. Um, there are a lot of components of software, some AI enabled and some not that uh, just make our lives so much better. There is so, I mean, a lot of the people on this call will know this, but just to just emphasize it, there is so much AI going on right now as you and I speak and this whole group listens. There's so much AI helping with signal processing. Yeah, you have signal processing algorithms that were developed a long time ago that are very helpful and deterministic, but there's a lot of learning going on in terms of blowing backgrounds and blocking out noises and this sort of stuff. There's so much going on as we talk right now. There's so much going on in the Google Docs that we collaborate on. We collaborated on before this. Um, my, my math nemesis from high school actually built a lot of that, built some of the core algorithms, the core learning algorithms in Google Docs that uh, essentially figure out when someone is trying to type over someone else and prevents it from happening, um, prevents a collision from happening. So that notion of invisible AI, it's not like, I think, a novel notion is in like, something that would be nice, it's actually the end goal. It's to make this stuff as invisible as po possible. It's to, to abstract as much as we can away so that we can be as uniquely human um, as we would like to be and our best place to be. Um, so I think this is true of a lot of products and I think it's a good design paradigm, which is how do you make the AI invisible um, or how do you make the prediction um, in place like how do you put the prediction in a place where people can actually use it you know it's one thing to get a prediction of how many sandwiches you need to make tomorrow but it's another thing to get that prediction as you're filling out the order form for bread right and so that is it's not just about making it invisible it's about making it there or visible when you need it to be visible um, so i could go on and on um, but at the risk of being too abstract, I won't, but I, I'm really glad you brought up the notion of invisible AI because I want to be clear that I think that's the goal, not a nice to have. Awesome. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about what is an AI first company? Mm. And can you give some current examples of AI first companies that are winning today? Yeah. So I'll say two things, um, one annoying and one encouraging. Um, an AI first company is a company that puts AI first. Um, but what does that mean? It means putting AI somewhere at the start of conversations about everything in your business, whether it's who are we going to hire? People. Um, what are we going to charge for this? Pricing. Are we going to charge in such a way where we encourage usage and data collection? We incentivize contributions of data or are we going to charge on some other basis? Um, what, what laws do we have to care about and work around? Policy. What, pro what are we going to build product? Every conversation that you have at a company about any part of your strategy needs to involve AI if you have a shot at building, if you're going to have a shot at building the sort of competitive advantage, which I contend is the most powerful out there, data learning effects. Because if you don't start collecting the data, if you don't start managing it correctly, and if you don't start thinking about how to use that to build a better product for your customers, now... Putting it first now, it's really hard to catch up later. You can't just like create the data out of nowhere later. So that's what an AI first company is. Um, the encouraging part of my answer is, you know, it's not the case that an AI first company has to use AI from day one. Any existing company can transform itself into an AI first company. I mean, you know, to borrow a sort of annoying term, digital transformation, like it's not like you have to start digital to be digital. You can be a media company that has printed newspapers for many years and turn all that into a digital format and then adapt really well like the New York Times and others have. 
And you don't have to have started as a company that makes robots, but you can automate little bits of your existing process in your factory that makes ski boots or whatever you make. Um, so an AI first company doesn't have to start that way. Um, um, I, should, I should give some examples, sorry. Um, so the I'll put it in three buckets. Um, of the big tech companies, I'd say Google is the one that was AI from day one. Search algorithms are AIs. They collected data super deliberately to make everything better from day one. They gave away products for free. They still give away so much for free to reinforce that data learning effect that they have. So that's of the big tech companies. They're the, that's the best example of an AI first company. It's sort of boring to say that, but it's just absolutely true in my mind. Um, of the, the sort of less obvious tech companies, the ones that have transformed into AI first, I think Salesforce has done a really good job. It was collecting lots of data for years by, and putting all this stuff in, in the cloud by having your CRM in the cloud. It wasn't really using it. And then they went through quite a few acquisitions transformed everything, transformed the ecosystem, gave incentives to contribute data, gave incentives to people to build AIs on top of Salesforce data. And I think now they enable a lot of businesses to be AI first. And then of old line companies, you know, a lot of them have done really well at incorporating AI into their products in ways that are probably small in terms of how much of the product suite they make up, but really powerful. You know, a lot of MRI machines you buy these days from Philips, like a very old company, has some AI in it, has some computer vision in it, has all sorts of stuff in it. So there are a heap of old line companies that have AI everywhere in their products. You know, and and, and I, can, I don't have to go through the obvious examples that um, have a lot of robots like Toyota and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think a lot of companies have meaningful AI in a very small part of their business. Um. Let me ask you from a from a startup or a VC perspective, um, and you know one of the funny things about a VC is that you 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 are a cheerleader for innovation in general. You you try to attract all of that positive, optimistic energy to you in the form of all these startups, and then your job is to inject as much skepticism into those conversations as you can. So let me, you know, it, it to me it almost sounds like you know when you think about the fact that this is clearly, you know, the smartest mm -hmm. large companies, whether they're big tech or big corporates or whatever, that they're aware of this. This is not a, mm -hmm. you know, the smartest people, these companies at the, at the leaders, this is not news to them, right? So mm -hmm. I would actually imagine that in, in a lot of cases, this actually makes the startup's job harder, mm -hmm. right? Because the algorithms are sort of available, the talent is out there, right? The data is sitting, the data is off the starting point or the customer interactions, whatever it is that you're going to start to generate, whether it's existing data, proprietary data, or novel data that you're trying to generate so that you can run these algorithms in the first place. As a startup, you start with nothing, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas the incumbent that you're up against has all that stuff. They have years of it sometimes sitting in a warehouse somewhere that all they need to do is unlock, mm -hmm. right? Does this actually make it tougher for startups in a lot of ways? It makes it easier and tougher. It does both for sure. But mostly it makes it easier. Because, I, because I'm a crotchety old man, let's start with, the, with where it makes it tougher. Yeah, what, for sure. What's, like what's a lot of incumbents can now? wake up tomorrow and use all the data, as you said, they've just accidentally collected and luckily put somewhere in some database um, and build a really powerful system. Like a lot of the um, medical imaging companies are collecting images all day long. They have the system of record where everyone stores every single X-ray and they can just go and apply a lot of stuff off the shelf, a lot of open source computer vision models and whatnot, and build really good systems for detecting whether someone has broken their femur or their wrist or something. And that is so hard for a startup to do because there are basically two or three companies that have all those images and they have no leverage against them. So it's incredibly hard um, in some domains. And that's the point. Like in some areas, it is the case that there are incumbents that have a lot of data, only they or one or two other companies have it, and they're savvy enough, attractive enough to people with certain skills and whatnot, have enough spare cash to experiment. And I wouldn't want to be competing against them. No way. Now, then it's just a question of degree. In a lot of industries where incumbents have all the data and none of the talent, where it's actually quite fragmented where the data exists. So there's a role for someone to be an aggregator. And I talk about what it means to, like, to have AI first aggregation as your strategy there. And then you get, get further and further where 
the data is super fragmented or doesn't exist at all and has to be collected. And then there's an opportunity for a startup to come in and collect it, you know, by offering incentives, forming a data coalition, even just synthesizing data um, from nothing, which in some domains is what needs to be done to create a sufficiently powerful system. Um, so, you know, it's, it's totally a spectrum and it's not just a one dimensional spectrum. It's not just a line. It's, it's about fragmentation of data and where that sits. It's about skill and talent um, and ability to attract it and whatnot. And then it's about applications. You know, is there one application for this data? Is this data going to feed one type of model or many types of model with many different applications? So there's sort of lots of different considerations here um, in terms of figuring out, all right, what's my entry strategy? And am I entering a market that's going to be really hard or is it going to be really easy for me? Um, the fact is it's a rising tide. There's so much AI needed if we are to uh, have sufficient leverage over our environment to be able to eat well and not burn down the planet and whatever else in the meantime. Um, we need more technology. We need more levers to help us get through the next century. And um, you know, not, not, it's not the case that just a couple of companies are going to build it. Bit of a platitudinous yeah. comment, but slightly positive one to finish on. Very cool. Uh, we're get, now going to be joined by Gleb, who mm -hmm. is based in Estonia. Uh, thank you very much. Mike Testuna dos tres. Uh, my name is Gleb. I'm pitch coach. And I have a question regarding, very, very silly question, definitions for one, deep tech, two, AI. Context here, two months ago, I was listening to a, a applied AI conference uh, in Germany and Early Bird Ventures, Atomico, some folks working there, a few other funds were talking about definitions of AI. And I simply want to really understand from a pitch coach perspective, both you know, for founders and VCs, what's the working definition of those terms? Because it seems there's some mm -hmm. no confusion on that. Super silly question. I, I would love to hear your take. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, on the first one, yeah, there is a lot of confusion. And like, frankly, it's because... Uh, it's not a good term. Um, deep tech. I don't know. I honestly can't answer that one. I'll give you a more useful answer to the one that uh, I talk about all the time, which is AI. So I think the word artificial here is really important. AI is something that we're not. It's something that can operate in a way we can't. More reliably, more quickly, more efficiently, lower cost or more perceptively. Uh, and so, and this is sort of a, uh, a sort of self-reinforcing definition is in, if we define AI this way, we're going to focus on building things that can do things we can't. And we're not just gonna focus on trying to emulate ourselves, which would arguably not have much point. Um, and so to bring this down to more sort of practical examples, AIs can, for example, run a calculation over and over again and not get it wrong. They can run calculations of a larger number of variables than we can hold in our head. They can um, perceive things that are out of our immediate perception. So they can perceive things across millions of cameras all at once or millions of gas sensors or whatnot. So that's my working defi definition of AI. It's a form of intelligence that we don't have. Now, I'll just very quickly define what I mean by intelligence. For me, intelligence is your rate of learning. And so it's not just about calculating or perceiving, it's about calculating and perceiving so that you can learn something, so that the next time you calculate or perceive something, it's going to be more accurate. That's what I mean. Very cool. We're now gonna be joined by Anupan, and he's a founder of Poly, and he's based in the UK. Uh, hello. So hey. my, my question is around, uh, uh, around, you know, typically when you build a software company as a SaaS, you offer as an API and, you know, it's, it's pretty standard to your customers. With coming to AI, you know, there's always a bit of customization based on the, you know, customer's data and all that. So, uh, you know, typically, you know, you, you move as a company from the product point, so there's a service element involved in it, right? So how do you think about, you know, not becoming a service company when you are building an AI company? 
for mm-hmm. our enterprise you know segment and and stay as as a product because you know you want to have that that scaling effect of of a product company mm-hmm. yeah i think it's about having a path right um there's this sort of now originally quite useful but now platitudinous comment do things that don't scale there is the consideration that you know, every customer is going to be slightly idiosyncratic in how they store data, how they manage data, and you need that data to feed your self-learning system. And every customer's reality is slightly different. It's We have a shared reality, like we all walk through the same world, we all have the same information available to us in certain situations, not in all situations, but we all have a different reality. I'm trying to achieve something that's probably different to what you're trying to achieve. One factory is trying to produce a good with certain characteristics, like it might be trying to produce a good that's waterproof and another factory is trying to pr- produce a, a jacket that's windproof. And so they're gonna do different testing and be optimizing for different qualities in the end product. And so what I'm getting at here is because every customer stores data differently, because every customer's reality or what they're optimizing for is slightly different, there are going to be differences in what they're seeking from you, what they're seeking from you in terms of automating something or predicting something. And so, of course, there are going to be differences. You just have to figure out, is there enough commonality between customers to allow you to, over time, earn a strong enough gross margin? And I get to this in the um, second last chapter of the book, the last bit of the second last chapter, where I talk about machine earning, which is how do you set up the right accounting metrics from day one to make sure you're properly accounting for the cost of producing a prediction, the data ETL costs, the data labeling costs, the research and development costs, and then attaching those to a customer so that you know on a unit basis, like on a per customer or a per product basis, that what you're doing is going to be profitable, firstly on a gross basis and then on a net basis. And so, um, you know, for example, when entering a market, if you have this framework, you can go, all right, in this industry, there are 50 systems of record. There are 50 different types of databases people use. And we're actually not going to be able to capture our, our SAM, our specific addressable market, unless we build those 50 data integrations. Okay, what's that going to cost us? That could cost you $50 million. It could take a really long time. That's not a good market for a startup to enter. Um, So if you have this framework and you apply it, you can make better decisions about what to enter and what to build to your point so that you don't end up being in a situation where you're just time after time doing a one-off service for a customer to get their data or to label their data or to build them a model with custom features. Um, So yeah, it's a big challenge. Um, It's something that, you know, we need to be um, very cognizant of when forming the strategy for a startup. And, but it's something around which you can have frameworks and um, apply metrics to make sure you don't get stuck in a situation where you're doing lots of unscalable and um, more importantly, unprofitable things. And I, I cover that quite extensively in one of the chapters in the book. Awesome. We're now gonna be joined by Dror. He is the mm-hmm. CEO of Test Story Technologies. Uh, hey, Ash, nice to meet you. I um, want to ask, you know, building on the previous question about deep tech, is there any other technologies that you see as a complementary fit uh, to the AI world and vice versa that AI would complement them? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, essentially, it's all heading in the same direction, right? Which is we're building different types of computers to deal with more types of calculations that we have to do. Quantum computers, um, tensor-based computers, lots of different types of computers, um, biologically inspired computers. And they will help us calculate different types of data with, um, through different types of algorithms at a given speed or power requirement or, or cost, or other form of cost. And so a lot of the chip technology is super complementary to AI. Um, the data collection technologies are super complementary to AI. As in, if we're able to collect different types of images in our world, like we that capture more of the light spectrum, 
um, for example, or if we're able to capture different types of information about gases in the atmosphere um, with higher fidelity, more cheaply, more completely um, you know, blanket the globe with these sensors, we might be able to build different, a different understanding of, of our environment. So a lot of the sensing technologies are going to feed into um, our ability to intelligently um, will be more intelligent to learn about our reality, learn about our environment for the end purposes of like making better decisions every day. So a lot of the sense chip technologies, a lot of the sensing technologies, and then there's sort of levels below that. So for example, a different type of diagnostic, medical diagnostic is a sensing technology really. Um, it's figuring out something that is, exists in your blood or in some biological substrate in your tissues. Um, and then if you have that information from the diagnostic and you have that information you know, across millions of people, you might learn something. Um, <clears throat> so lots and lots of technologies around calculation and sensing um, are being developed all over the place um, that are, are very complementary to AI. If you just consider AI being you know, the thing that gets the data and turns it into information that you can then learn from. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. So I think your 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 definition of of AI as a learning system and that you can measure AI by the rate of learning I think is is very helpful and and I think it focuses the mind on on the right way to think about this. Um, I want to ask you about sort of mega trends. In other words, is mm -hmm. is AI just another name for what people are doing with software in general? In other words, is, is it is, is it just a question of degree where some people are just doing it badly and other people are doing it better? But basically anytime you're collecting data and using it to make decisions one way or another, you're you're building some version of an AI. Or is it or is there some is mm -hmm. there something that comes after AI or is there some counter trend that we can talk about? Or are mm -hmm. people resistant to it? Is it is is there still a debate about whether this is the mm -hmm. only direction of software or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think a lot of technology and a lot of software actually has no AI at all. And so I think what's missing from a lot of that software and technology is the very last step, which is the learning step. So yes, a lot of software collects data. CRMs collect data, ERPs collect data. Um, lots of software, human resources management systems, they all collect data. Now, data is just ones and zeros. You can't really do anything with it. A lot of software also turns that data into information. So ETL software, um, software that just lets people click around and move things around, put things in spreadsheets, present it the right way, put it in a dashboard. Then you have information. You don't just have ones and zeros, but you've got like pie charts, you've got other things. And that's where most software stops in delivering information. So it's called information technology. And at that point, humans make decisions with the information. They figure out, okay, why are people leaving our company? It's because, oh, wow, we figured out from a system that collects data in surveys and then presents that data as information in graphs, we can, we can see that a lot of people don't like their commute. And so that's why they're leaving our company and we need to move our office. But that decision is made by human. Or I look at all the leads that some system has collected for me to sell to, and I have to decide who to call next. I have to decide how to pitch that customer. I have to decide how to write that email, what to put in that email. So that's where most software stops, collecting data and turning it into information. Then it's up to the human to make the decision, make the prediction about what email is going to open, be opened more or what's, what marketing campaign is going to work best. What AI does is that last bit, right? It actually does the learning for us. And most software just doesn't do that. Like objective, I mean, it, doesn't. It, it could be that I'm, I'm hanging around, you know, futuristic software too much. So to me, it hmm. looks like everyone is going in this direction. So yeah. Uh, but let's 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 just play that out a little bit for me. Like sure. you know, you, you obviously wrote a book, right, with a with a point of view that this is where people mm -hmm. should go, this is where we can go, this mm -hmm. is the way to unleash the full power of the data and the comp and, mm -hmm. and the compute that we have, right? Are are there is there a I mean they may be too embarrassed to raise their heads up, but is there mm -hmm. a counter movement that says no, you know, don't trust AI? Yeah, I mean, I, I see this oh, on yeah. the fringes of some of what we look at. We're like, you know, even even a tool, for example, that you know about that builds tooling for data scientists where they can actually mm -hmm. automate a ton of the mm -hmm. DNN building themselves. They're actually tuning that back because the data scientists themselves don't want auto <laughs> modeling, yeah. right? Because they don't want you to build a DNN for them. They want to pretend that they're doing it. So, okay, fine, right? But is that, um, are you seeing a, 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 
in opposition to some of this? A hundred percent. And that's such a good example because I see this too, which is a lot of the resistance actually comes most from the people building these models because they can see just how much hand tuning is involved, just how much manual data labeling is involved. And they're very skeptical that that can be automated. And, you know, I spend most of my time these days in um, finding and backing tools for data scientists and machine learning engineers. And it's so hard to do research on these companies and figure out if people are going to buy these products because the people buying them are so skeptical that you can automate what they're doing. So I see that a lot too. Um, but that's just an extreme example. I mean, yeah, you see it in absolutely every industry, you know, from the sort of now a little bit prosaic and annoying and lot of type arguments of, well, we don't want to adopt it because it's going to take up someone's job to the arguments that I think are really productive to have, which is we don't want to adopt it because we think that people should have a right to protecting their own data and it shouldn't be put into some big system. So there's re, um, sort of resistance that comes from that angle or the data privacy angle for sure um, to we don't want to adopt it because we can't regulate it to we don't want to adopt it because it's too risky. And that's where, you know, I think it is very, very healthy to have a lot of skepticism about adopting AI. And I talk about this too, which is you've really got to consider the shape of the payoff. And it is just the case that AI cannot work over certain data sets and learn over certain um, information such that it will be accurate enough that you can rely on it. And it's this weird mix of educating people about what the AI can actually do so that they rely on it just enough, but not too much. And the obvious examples are in the medical industry and um, in like very high risk or high consequence applications where there's probably not enough skepticism actually to go against your question, to be honest, at least on the side of stuff that's getting funded and on the side of like innovators I talk to. Frankly, I don't think a lot of them are skeptical enough about what the AI can do. They're, they're too naive. Um, and it's not until you put them in front of someone with a lot, like many, many years of experience in, in a problem domain, do they realize, oh, actually, we can't take account of that. Yeah. So anyway, I see skepticism all over the place. A lot of it is really well-placed and a lot of it is really not. Yeah. And there's a whole other question about that, about explainability and the coexistence of AI yeah. with people and so on. But I, I, I want to bring in uh, a founder named Vicky Knott, who's the CEO of Crux OCM, uh, one of our portfolio companies based in Canada. Uh, Vicky, take it away. Hi. Um, hi, Ash. I, I'm hi. loving this because like we struggle all the time with, um, yeah, like calling ourselves AI. And I think it's because like we you know, we literally, we fit your definition to a T, but we're in critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the founders are chemical electrical engineers. Like what we do is predictive modeling control systems, mm -hmm. which is by your definition, AI, because it's continually tuning itself and, and, and seeking mm -hmm. that optimal solution, right? So, so I'd love to hear your take on like, you know, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I still wanted to ask the question anyway, like, so we, when we're meeting with our customers, we will not call it AI. We're just mm -hmm. like, no, here's how it computes. Here's how we build the models. You know, here's what it's all, it's always minimizing error for you. And what we're doing is we're controlling um, critical infrastructure, such as like oil pipelines on behalf of control room operators. So mm -hmm. we won't use, we won't say AI or ML because we don't want them to think that it's something that we're not in mm -hmm. control of. Um, but then sometimes we'll be asked like, oh, well, do you use ML? And then we'll kind of dance around it a little bit. Cause we're like, well, in, you know, we'll use it for soft sensors or we'll use it for in these specific cases. But it's so interesting how like, you know, it seems like in one part of the world, it's like, use these words, say these words. But then when you actually get into deep tech, um, I'm not comfortable using the words. I'm like, no, here's how it actually works. And, and it's control systems, right? Like, I don't want to just use a blanket term. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what else you've seen in, in those critical infrastructures for how folks handle that. So, sorry, is your question... How do you get around skepticism in the use of AI and critical infrastructure applications? Is that your question? Or is nope. it no, else? the question is, is more around the, um, like, I won't say those terms, like uh -huh. in, in, in critical infrastructure. And, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on 
like why that is like I'm so hesitant even talking to VCs like I won't use those terms because my customers don't trust them so I won't use the yeah. terms I'm just like I'll like no it's control it's control theory right or, or no it's it's predictive modeling it's right mm -hmm. like I'll use other terms but based on your definition those are all AI so the question yeah, I mean is, I think yeah. this is more of a communication thing than anything and it's just use the terms people understand and right. focus on the value and, you know, the most successful pitches are ones that focus on showing the customer what they're going to get out of the using the technology. Like, it's just a tool. It's not a solution often. Sometimes it's a complete solution. And you have to talk about things in terms of the ROI. And um, yeah. that's, you know, all throughout the book, which is just a focus on when you talk about this stuff, talk about it in terms of ROI. And you can talk about AI in terms of ROI. It's not something special. It's not something that's so completely different from anything else out there that the basic concept of what do I put into this and what do I get out of it doesn't apply. It totally does apply. Okay, so then I guess you're like, just to follow up on that, um, that totally makes sense. And like, that's totally how we approach it with customers. Do you think we could be hurting ourselves by not using a term AI when we talk to VCs? Uh, maybe, it depends who you're talking to. Um, if they know what they're talking about, if they have a strong background in the field, it's best to get right to, you know, what data are you collecting, what experiments are you running and what results are you getting? If mm -hmm. they don't have a background in the field, will you start at a higher rung on the ladder of abstraction? Um, so it depend, depends how much they know. Okay. Okay. Because I haven't used it and I'm thinking from our talk that I should be using it more. So thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I probably still wouldn't, to be honest. And again, focus on the value you're providing to your customers. Like people can work out where that value is coming from later, but if there's no value, there's no conversation. Cool. Um, let me ask you a little bit, uh, Ash, about, you know, we chatted about this earlier, the, the sort of the Martin Casado thesis on, mm -hmm. on the challenges facing the, the profitability of AI first startups. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he's, he's got an argument that, you know, I think a lot of people have, have seen and you know, made about, about how, you know, it's, it's, you know, you, you end up having lower gross margins because you're building these very complicated models that you sort of need to maintain for multiple customers. It's never really easy mm -hmm. to bring one, a model from one customer one to customer two. Um, there's all these thorny edge cases within customers. There are customers who themselves become edge cases. It can be hard for you to predict a priori whether your model is going to work perfectly and at what level for which customer, unless they're exactly identical. Um, and then ultimately weaker defensive modes because of the commoditization of these AI models. And I don't think I don't think Martin is arguing that people shouldn't use AI or that this is a, a dumb mm -hmm. thing to do. But I think he's sort of highlighting some of these challenges for startups. And I, I, I'd love it if you could sort of react to that and, and you know, I know you've thought a lot about this, you know, what, you know, A, is he right or wrong and what should people do about this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a fairly general statement that, you know, you want to try to build a company that is scalable and the sign of scalability is that you have high gross margins because the incremental cost of serving an incremental customer is lower and lower it gets marginally lower over time so i think it's just a general point i think it's an article that could have easily be written in the software era 20 years ago and could easily and was easily written today um and that is sure you can go and make bespoke software for all sorts of customers a lot of people did that a lot of people make made a lot of money doing that and some people made even more money by making one piece of software that served many customers like viva in the one industry. And some people made even more money by making one piece of software that served lots and lots of customers in lots of lots of industries like Salesforce. But there are a lot of people that build custom CRMs for one company and they just they just do that on a services basis. So that happened in the software industry and that's happening in the AI industry. And so it's just sort of like, okay, so what? And well, I think the so me, what is- Let me back on that a little bit though. I think what he's arguing though, right? And I, I, I you know, Far be it for me to sort of try to channel him, but I think what he's arguing is that AI, the, the shift to the era of AI makes software fundamentally less profitable a business in general for many companies because mm. of the false idea they have that now that we have the capability to reason about all of this data and learn from it and draw conclusions, mm. 
draw conclusions from it, that's going to be efficient. And he's saying, well, that's actually intrinsically less efficient than if all you're doing is storing a bunch of telephone numbers in a database. That mm. definitely scales across, you know, because CRMs are all the same, but reasoning mm. about my sales process versus your sales process, that could lead us down an infinite rabbit hole of yeah. tweaking models, right? That I think he's pointing out a lot of founders are not aware of this. They think, oh, I've got this magic machine I built for customer one. It does nothing for customer two unless you tweak it for several weeks. Mm -hmm. it's so, so it's intrinsically less efficient if you assume it's all manual. But the reality is, and you know this because you back companies that are automating so much of the process of doing data science and machine learning, is that it's not intrinsically all manual. We're getting better and better at automating more and more of the steps in the process of building an intelligent system, like data cleaning, like data labeling, like data consolidation, like model building, model monitoring, et cetera. And yes, it was true at the start of the AI first era, which wasn't very long ago, it was a couple of years ago, just as it was true as at the start of the software era, that there were really high upfront costs. So the software area, era, you couldn't just get someone else's computing infrastructure and throw an application onto it. Um, you didn't have platforms as a service. You had to build it all yourself. And so you needed five to $10 million to get started. And yes, at the start of the AI era, you couldn't just get a pre-trained model and throw a bunch of data into it and then slap a dashboard on top of it or an interface on top of it and sell it to a customer as an AI first product. You had to build all of that yourself and you needed $5 million to get started. It is the case as we abstract away a lot of these steps in building an AI, as in we make that easier for people to do, that we are able to deliver this soft build and deliver this software more cheaply. And so I think it's just like a point in time observation and it's not a conclusion. Yeah. And it's certainly not a dynamic model you can use to approach how to build a company. The, yeah. Yeah. On the, the observation today, not long at all after that article was written, is that a whole bunch of the stuff they write about is already significantly more automated than it was. And the dynamic framework you can use is like what I have in the book under machine earning, which is like, all right, let's actually measure the costs of delivering this to a customer and figure out if it's profitable or not. Um, the, the article is just a dead end because it just says it's expensive. Okay. And so what the opportunity yeah. is to make it cheap. Well, I, look, I, I think it's a, it's a, it was a useful warning sign at a point of time. Um, yeah. 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 Think, That's a very think, good summary. I think, I think what you're pointing out is that times have changed and the tools are there. So let me ask you what I think might be the follow on question, which, mm. which you know, is, doesn't that mean that, that, well, when a founder says to me, for example, mm -hmm. I have this amazing team of data scientists and we've got these great mm -hmm. algorithms and we've got, we can you know, look, look what we can do with this data set. That's my moat. Mm. I, I tend to get turned off by that. I'm like, I, I have mm. very hard time believing that that's the moat that you think it is. Right. Mm. Um, what is your take on that? Where is the, where are the moats for these kind of companies? Yeah. Great question. Cause this is getting to the, so what, and that is, it's a spectrum, right? As in, in some verticals, what that founder is generally pitching actually I think is true, which is no one else has collected the data. No one else has bothered to figure out what needs to be automated and no one else has built the models. So we can give like a super prosaic, like narrow example of, you know, um, uh, and I saw a company doing this recently and I think they'll be very successful, which is, they're optimizing the use of a bioreactor, like something you put a whole bunch of stuff in and then like grow a bunch of stuff in for 24 hours. And then you take that out and put it in a drug, like you're growing cultures and stuff. Um, there are, and these are really expensive machines and you want them running 24 seven and you don't want them to break down because you want to be utilizing them all the time because you spent so much on them. And they are collecting... <laughs> all the data from these machines and optimizing the use of them, basically. And it is the case that that's worth a lot of money to a couple of pharmaceutical companies out there. And if they're the only company that does it, and it seems like so far, they're the only company with the right mix of access to data, access to talent, models that are working, access to customers, 
they're the only company that does that. They could be a really valuable company. They could command, you know, tens of millions of dollars from each customer, probably a couple of dozen customers, could be a couple of hundred million dollar business. Now, if you think about something a little bit less general than that, like getting all the images out of MRI machines, you know, I'd find it really hard to believe that story, which is we've got all the images out of MRI machines and we're going to be able to detect everything because, you know, you don't have leverage over, the, as I said, the source of that data. So many different problems there. You're going to have to do a different model for each body part and each condition and blah, blah, blah. And every data set is going to be different. I, that's, that's not something I believe. So I, I was going to ask you, I, I, I didn't want to ask you, I thought the question might be too annoying, but I was going to ask you, what do you think of the statement data is the new oil? And I think you're saying <laughs> sometimes, right? I think that's what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, maybe sometimes, but basically never. Um, and I approach this head on in the first chapter of the book, which is, and this is the reason I wrote this book, because what AI gives you is a new type of competitive advantage and no one has the vocabulary to describe it and no one has the metrics to measure it. And what that competitive advantage is called is a data learning effect. And it involves a critical mass of data. You do need a certain scale of data. In some industries, that's a huge amount of data. And for some industries or for some problems, it's not a lot of data. And you do need a way to turn that data into information. And you do need a way to learn over that information, like a machine learning model. I'm not going to go in and like properly describe or define a DLE right now. If it was easy to do in 30 seconds, I would have done a, you know, just written an article rather than written a book. But that's the point. Like data is not the new oil. It's just a little bit of the whole puzzle. And it's a little part of the big challenge of building a super defensible business. It's a, an important part. It's a crucial part. It's a precursor, but it's just a part. And you need a lot of the other things as well. That's a great way to frame it. We're gonna be joined again by Gleb from Estonia. Uh, Thank you very much. This is super stimulating, a super stimulating conversation. Uh, one thing I want to combine here is bring back the conversation a little bit about the data scientists being skeptical about automating some of their work, but then put that into perspective of this competitive edge that you're talking about just now and apply this to your job essentially, or at least the, the investment professional, the VC and so forth. And so in 2020, I've, uh, I've been reading a paper published one of the, uh, a researcher in the, in the field of VC, and he informally interviewed roughly 63 VCs, and he was kind of asking them uh, about their attitudes in regards to automating through machine learning tools some of the deal screening processes. And so what turned out of that, that they were super skeptical in many ways, and one of this came down to this automation control trade-off and uh, this mi you know, mistrust in the black box model. And so like what I'm read out of it is this concern or hesitation to adopt it. So again, it echoes what you were talking about seemingly about the data scientists, but you also talk about now the competitive edge. And I would love to see your perspective because I think you were, you know, you're massively successful in, you know, syndication, angel list and all those tools. And I just want to hear your take. And obviously Angular uh, Ventures and, and so forth and all of that. I would love to hear your take on this specifically in this domain of investments. Hopefully I'm clear. If not, let me know. So you're asking how can we apply AI to make better investments? Is that right? Oh, that's a bit of a reduced version of it. So let me, <laughs> yeah. um, VCs based on this paper, it seems we're skeptical of, of uh, using yeah. ML tools to screen deals. Yeah. Would then in this context, you use yeah. ML screening tools. Do you think it's feasible? Do you think it's a good idea? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Okay. how come they're so skeptical? Hopefully I'm clear, but yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, no, that's clear. I'm glad you focused it in on screening because on that particular question, I, I, I agree with uh, most of the survey respondents, I guess, in that I don't think it's very useful for screening at all. Look, I was at AngelList. We had the best data on companies that you could get. We had all the internal metrics and everything. And the one thing that was most predictive of a seed stage startup success was who invested in the seed round. That was it. You could look at all sorts of traction metrics and whatever else, because the reality is, and it goes back to a lot of what we were saying, Every company is different. Every company has a North Star metric. Every company is trying to provide different value to its customer set. And there's no one model that can help you figure out if it's providing that value to a sufficient degree where it's going to be a valuable company. 
every company is in a different industry. It's just like a, a solution space that's the size of the universe. So that's not a useful way to apply machine learning to screen companies um, to figure out if they're good companies. However, that said, and just sort of extending a bit beyond your question, I think machine learning is very useful in figuring out who to even talk to, as in doing network analysis and figuring out who's connecting with who, what teams are being formed, doing analysis on um, you know, what investors are investing in what areas and where the follow-on funding is because companies need a lot of money to go from zero to one. Um, so I think it's useful in some parts of the investment process. And I don't just think it is like we, I use it a lot in lots of parts of our investment process and spend a lot of money on data and building systems to do that. But I don't use it to screen companies. Awesome. Uh, so we're running out of time. So I'll ask only one or two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, do you, for an AI first company startup, mm -hmm. um, do the co-founders need to be AI experienced in mm. your um, from your point of view, or can they hire for the role? Yeah. So typically, um, the the companies I find are. 50-50, someone with a lot of experience in the domain, understands the problem, has a good idea of like how to make a prediction around a certain industrial problem. And then someone who can build that, someone who can talk to the customers and get the data and understand what they're trying to solve, and another person to help build the model that will solve it. So that's typically the case with sort of vertical applications of machine learning to a specific industrial problem. Um, obviously for, well, not obviously, for data science and machine learning tools, the teams are mostly data scientists and machine learning engineers because they're, the problem they're solving is their own problem. Um, so yeah, you see a really good mix of teams. It just depends on the problem you're solving. Brilliant. So I'll try to squeeze in one more question. Yeah, we've got one more, two minutes. <laughs> um, so AI usually means uh, transferring tasks uh, from human to machines. Mm -hmm. What is the MVP in this context, what do you say? Mm. Really, really good question. And this goes to the concept of lean AI, which is a whole chapter in the book. And that is, you know, firstly, of course, you got to understand what the customer's problem is. Now, an MVP means defining the model features. Like what is going to maybe be predictive? Is it the case that every time a bottle cap is one millimeter too big, it won't fit? Or is it two millimeters? Or every time it's tempered at 98 degrees it fails the quality test but when it's tempered at 120 degrees it passes so you sort of have an idea of that if you've worked in this bottle cap factory for a long time um figuring out the model features then testing it trying to generate that prediction all right let's use the data we've got from the past and see if the model we've developed based on what we thought is predictive actually did predict it well then you show a report to someone, your customer and say, look, we got this right with to like 80% accuracy. Is that meaningful enough for you to make a difference? For example, if knowing at 80%, with 80% accuracy ahead of time, if something is going to not pass the test, the quality test, you know, is that going to help you deliver a better product? Is that going to help you reduce failures? Is that going to help you reduce the cost of production or something? Until you get that feedback, then you go and collect more data based on you know, what their requirements are. Does it need to be more accurate? Does it need to be more reliable and whatnot? You retrain it and you go again. So the point is the MVP is actually what I call a put, a, pre a prediction usability threshold, a degree of accuracy where someone's ready to rely on it. Cool. Uh, Ash, uh, thank you so much. I know you have a hard stop, so we'll, we'll cut it yeah. off here, but uh, it looks like we could have gone on for a, you know, a bit longer, okay. and, and I guess that's a good reason to read the book. Um, so uh, thank you so much, um, and uh, uh, hope, hope, to, hope to see you in person soon. Yeah, me too. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much to everyone for the questions. Please do let me know of any feedback on the book, any questions you have as a result of it. I've got a thick skin. I'm easy to find, Ash Fontana, Gmail, Twitter, LinkedIn. Let me know awesome. and I'd be more than happy to help out anyone in the Angular community 